Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We warmly welcome you to Myth Busting the British Empire with guest speaker, historian and comedian Robin Cliffan. Tonight, we welcome an exciting mix of participants from both within and outside of the education sector. Welcome, everyone. We warmly welcome you on behalf of Hallam Teaching School Alliance. For those of you that don't know, we are based at Notre Dame High School in Sheffield. My name is Casey Bailey. I am an English teacher and an anti-racism training facilitator. Over these last five months, I have not been teaching English. My sole focus has been on delivering anti-racism training sessions. Um, I've delivered training sessions to a wide range of schools, universities, and businesses, including the University of Oxford and a global financial corporation. It's an exciting time. It seems as though we are on the cusp of an important sea change regarding how we think and talk about race in society. But we need to keep that societal momentum going. The hard work has only just begun. We have a lot of work to do within our organizations if we are serious about addressing structural inequities. How does tonight's webinar relate to anti-racism education? Well, as my fellow anti-racist educators will agree, it is time for us to challenge the pervasive whiteness of our curriculum. It is time for us to enable our students to look critically at Britain's colonial past. It is time for us to ensure that we are providing our students with a diverse range of texts, voices and perspectives in the curriculum. What we are talking about here is a move towards decolonizing our teaching and decolonizing our, our minds really, challenging our own world views. In tonight's education piece, Robin Cliffan will enable us to widen our view of British history, enabling us to take a more exploratory, critical view of the, of the British Empire. Robin is a historian, comedian and social justice campaigner. He studied at the University of Oxford and he is a campaigner for anti-racism and the reframing of historical narratives. Robin has developed educational shows with the British Museum, the Barbican, the Tate Modern, the v &A, and the New Scientist. It is with a great deal of excitement I introduce to you Robin Cliffan. Thank you Katie uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm very flattered to be here. Anyone who's watched um, Katie's anti-racism training will know how viscerally affecting and how stimulating it is so I'm really excited to be able to uh, share a platform with you Katie. Um, I want to say thanks to any teachers watching. I know it's a particularly intense time in education. So thank you for squeezing us in, in what must be an incredibly busy day. To anyone who's not a teacher, I know it's a particularly intense time generally. So thank you for squeezing us in between episodes of The Crown. I just wanted to say at the start, I'm not here to tell you what to do in your classroom. If you work in education, you know that much better than I do. This is just the continuation uh, of a conversation that I'm sure you've already been having. Um, and I'd love to hear your um, suggestions for um, books and reading lists as well uh, at the end of the talk. Um, and similarly to anyone who uh, isn't a teacher and who's just wants interested in the topic, let's keep the conversation going. Let's take it into our communities and start airing, I think this often neglected huge part of Britain's past. So let's get on with it guys. At myth busting the British empire, open your minds. I'm coming in. Let's start at the beginning at what is empire? Well, it's an extensive group of states or countries ruled over by a single monarch, an oligarchy, or a sovereign state. That is the dictionary definition. Empire is a relationship of power and dominance. There have, of course, been other empires in the past, Roman, Greek, Persian, Ottoman, and many empires that were contemporary to Britain's, particularly in Europe, uh, French, Belgium, Spanish, Portuguese. And although there is this fundamental relationship of power, there's also cross-pollination uh, between colonizer and colonized, and most empires involve assimilation, migration, and displacement, as well as conflict. <laughs> 
What do you think of when you hear the phrase British Empire? Now, this isn't a rhetorical question. I'd love you to write some answers in the chat. So let's see what people say. We've got cricket coming up, what wonderful. We've got uh, the jewel in the jewel in the Britain's crown. Uh, we've got violence, um, slavery, um, the Union Jack, the Queen, uh, redcoats, um, civilization, tea. Wonderful. So you're obviously a very um, well informed and educated audience. I think generally as a country, we have an unduly benign view of the British Empire. And our memory is fuzzy and it tends to revolve around certain images that don't necessarily do justice to the truth um, of what it was. Images like this, you know, just kind of colonialists, middle-aged white people in linen hats, sitting, sipping tea uh, on a lawn in denial of the fact that they're perpetuating a racial hierarchy or indeed gentlemen like this just playing cricket with their lovely straight bat there. And one of the reasons these images, myths are so pervasive, pervasive uh, is because of books like this, Our Empire Story by Henrietta Marshall, uh, written in 1909. And it's a triumphalist chocolate box biscuit tin view of empire that talks a lot about the colonizers and doesn't say much about the colonized. And that book was pervasive throughout the 20th century in primary and secondary schools. What makes Britain's empire unique? Well, the first thing that's very noticeable about it is its size. It reached its zenith, so its biggest uh, geographical area in 1919, when it encompassed one fourth of the globe or 125 times the landmass of the United Kingdom. And as you can see on the map, those countries colored in deep red were in 1919 part of the British empire. An even more alarming uh, and arresting map is this one. This shows all the countries in the world that have and have not at some point been occupied or invaded by the British. And you'll see that most of the world is pink. That means Britons have been there and the deep purple countries are the ones that have managed to resist the military influence of the UK. Only 22 countries have managed to um, not manage to escape uh, British invasion or occupation. So Britain has had an extensive presence uh, in the world over the last 400 years. Uh, why does Britain's empire have this reputation for being benign and fuzzy? Some of it is a intellectual question. Um, historians, of course, like to stick to their period. The British Empire stretches from 16th century Britain to 20th century Malaysia. It can be considered crass or even problematic to make huge sweeping judgments about something that is so big, so complex and so long. However, as reductive as this question might be, it is unavoidable and the moral legacy of empire haunts us. And I think if we step back and we're able to look at the evidence, we can see a vivid picture. And that's that the British Empire was often violent, exploitative, and based on a racial hierarchy. And there's lots of nuance and complex relationships that go on within empire, but we have to start with that broad premise. That's what empire was. The sun never set on the British Empire. And as the chartist Ernest Jones added, and the blood never dried. Or the sun never set on the British Empire because even God doesn't trust the British in the dark. We're in a moment when Black Lives Matter and anti-racism are asking questions of us. But are we really interrogating what those terms mean and what a lot of the language around anti-racism means in the context of being British? White privilege, for example, is in danger of becoming a meaningless buzzword, or even worse, something associated with that caricatured bogeyman, the militant left. Indeed, when we think of a racialized history, we tend to think of countries like the USA, South Africa, and Germany. 
Take slavery, for example. I think we're more likely to imagine the cotton and sugarcane plantations of the Deep South owned by Texans rather than the tobacco and coffee farms of the Caribbean owned by middle class English people. And when we think of the destruction of records, we're more likely to think of the Nazis than the British. But the British built so many uh, files of evidence when they left India that Delhi in 1947 was enveloped in thick smoke. It's time for us to interrogate whiteness in the context of being British and in the context of our empire. We're at a moment where the legacy of empire is being fiercely contested. In the courts, in the streets, Black Lives Matter are asking questions of us and our past. And I'd argue that this is not an erasure of history, but instead an active engagement with it. And what an opportunity as educators to ramp into a discussion on empire. And here are some of the Black Lives Matter protesters in Bristol in June in 2020 dumping the statue of Edward Colston, slave owner and philanthropist into the Bristol Harbour. Uh, I could, I'd argue that's probably the most interesting thing to have happened to a ten a penny and Victorian statue. And it's now been dredged up. Um, let's tell the story of that object and let's use that object as a way to talk about the passion of feeling and the contested um, emotions that empire still invokes in us as a country and it's, they, those feelings need to be aired, otherwise they stay insidiously under the surface. The legacy of empire is also bubbling up and informing how we make political decisions on a government level as well. Uh, the language of empire is very explicit and conspicuous in words such as empire 2.0 um, used around about the um, Brexit debate in 2016 during the referendum. But there's also a more insidious and subtle presence. Uh, the scandal over Windrush, for example, when the government deported Afro-Caribbean pensioners um, back to the Caribbean, and many, who, many of whom had lived here for over 70 years and worked here, made lives here. Um, that shows how quickly citizenship can be pulled from people of colour and how ready our political class are to define Britishness as whiteness. And it also displays a shocking ignorance on the history of migration and the contribution of those immigrants to the UK. And there is Paulette Wilson, one of the Windrush generation uh, who'd lived here for over 50 years. She was sent to Yarlswood Detention Centre um, for three months and she eventually got the right to remain, but as we know, many people didn't. There has never been a better time to talk about our imperial past. But when we teach British history, we tend to focus on the two world wars and monarchy. And that gives the British an undue view of themselves as a plucky underdog ruled by great men. The history of empire is largely absent from the curriculum, both at a primary and secondary school level. And I contest at university level as well. As history teachers will know, there is currently a migration and empire option for GCSE, but only 4% of pupils taking GCSE history choose it. That's compounded by the fact that 27% of pupils are black and minority ethnic. Add to that the fact that we need to interrogate whiteness itself. We're not just speaking to black and minority ethnic pupils. Whiteness itself needs to be questioned and interrogated. And this education filters up. 44% uh, of Britons thought that colonized countries were better off under British rule. That's from a YouGov survey in 2015. And the polling tends to fluctuate from between about 35 to 60% of people who think that the empire was generally beneficial to those that it colonized. And the people who think it was worse off tends to uh, hover around the 20% mark. Migration and empire are not marginal events, they are central to our national story. As it stands, the story we are telling is incomplete. That's a quote from the Running Me Trust um, report into education and empire published a few years ago. One of the reasons we have a blind spot in this area and indeed allow insidious myths to prevail 
is because we are ignorant. Ignorant in many cases by design. In 2011, five Kenyans sued the British government for damages, alleging that they were tortured during the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya during the 1950s. These pensioners won compensation, but the ruling also forced the British government to admit that it deliberately destroyed records. And when the British left Kenya, they dumped thousands of tons of papers into the sea. And the reason they did that was to cover up crimes against humanity, torture, and the existence of gulags for civilians and military personnel. What's emerged is a destruction of records that spans the British Empire, from Ghana, Malaysia, Cyprus to Uganda. And over the last 10 years, 1.2 million files have been released into the public domain. We are only just beginning to see what happened during the process of decolonization. And when the evidence changes, we should change our minds. There was a systematic policy um, to destroy records. Um, here's a illustration of that. This is from the um, Minister for the Colonies, uh, Ian McLeod. Post-independent governments must not get hold of materials that might embarrass Her Majesty's government or be used unethically by ministers in the success, successor government. Um, that's him speaking in the early 1960s as part of Harold Macmillan's government. Harold Macmillan, of course, famously, who did the Winds of Change speech that gave the idea of, gave an image of decolonization as a peaceful, graceful process where Britain just slowly lowered the flag um, to the national anthem. The reality was a lot more violent. Here's another uh, example of um, the destruction of records. This is the High Commissioner in Brunei writing to the Chief Librarian Bernard Cheeseman at the Commonwealth Relations Office. Real name, Bernard Cheeseman. Uh, my dear Cheese, can I off my own bat destroy some of these papers or should the whole lot be sent home for weeding or retention in your records? Which I think is quite a good example of the character of the British Empire. There's a systematic destruction of records, um, but on the other hand, there's kind of an eccentric relatability to the fact that they've got a librarian called Bernard Cheeseman. Here's some other things that we can uh, see in the records that are now in the National Archive uh, in Northern Rhodesia. Uh, colonial officials were issued with orders to destroy all papers which are likely to be interpreted either reasonably or by malice as indicating racial prejudice on behalf of Her Majesty's government. There's a lot of detail about how records should be destroyed. They should be reduced to ash and the ashes broken up or dumped at sea um, in weighted crates away from currents. Also uh, significantly, a lot of the documents were marked with DG, an abbreviation of deputy governor. Uh, but in fact, um, it's thought that that was a code um, to indicate that the papers uh, marked were for sight by British officers of European descent only. So what we see in this record is a acknowledgement that Britain uh, pursued policies of racial discrimination and that they attempted to cover them up. And as I say, this evidence has only come to light because of these guys. Um, these are four of the Kenyan pensioners tortured during Mau Mau who sued the British government. And what a debt we owe them as historians, um, for without them, a huge part of Britain's history would remain buried. Um, so nice one to these guys and their lovely bubble hats and collection of rather festive jumpers. So we're now gonna engage with some of the common uh, apologies for empire and try and bust some of those myths that we'll hear um, creeping up time and again. This is one of them. Uh, if you had to live under a foreign government, then the British empire was better than many of the other possibilities. That's from Jeremy Paxman um, and his book, Empire, What Ruling the World Did to the British. This is a, a common argument. Here is Jeremy Paxman. Uh, you all know Jeremy Paxman from Newsnight and University Challenge, and of course, the man who famously, famously wrote a vociferous letter to Marks and Spencers complaining about the thickness of their underpants. So quite a serious historian. And uh, no, he is, of course, a serious journalist, but he is not a uh, historian 
an academic historian. Um, but he published this book, he makes this argument, it's a pervasive argument, it goes a little bit like this. Yeah, sure, the British Empire was bad, but at least we're not French. At least we're not French, I think could be a defense for the entirety of British history, but at least we're not French or worse than that Portuguese or worse than that Belgium. And Europe as a whole does have a horrific imperial legacy. King Leopold of Belgium, for example, turned the Congolese Free State into a mass labor camp between 1870 to 1920. 50 percent of the population were murdered, 10 million people were killed. And if villages didn't reach their rubber quota, they'd have their hands and feet cut off. An event described by the historian Adam Hothschild as a tragedy of Holocaust-like proportions. There is no denying that horrific and awful legacy. However, it does not set the moral bar very high. And I think if we pursue that line, we end up on a slippery slope of moral relativism. Furthermore, it ignores very real British atrocities, and there are too many to mention, but here's a few. Uh, the Boer War, 1899 to 1902. That's when the British Empire fought the Boers for hegemony over South Africa. The Boers are the Dutch speaking, or well, descendants of Dutch speaking settlers in South Africa, um, who were also um, vying for control of the region. The British defeated the Boers in a conventional military fashion, but the Boers continued a guerrilla war action. The British response was to imprison thousands of women and children in concentration camps, ultimately causing the death of 40,000 people due to disease and starvation. The Bengali famine of 1942 and 43, where the British government deliberately exported rice from the Indian continent, knowing that it would starve the population there and between three and four million people died. And that's still the only uh, famine to have occurred on the Indian continent that wasn't caused by drought. Or the Tasmanian War, 1825 to 1832, when British settlers in the island of Tasmania, just off the coast of Australia, were given immunity to murder Aboriginals, um, and they did, and nearly the entire population um, of indigenous Aboriginals uh, were wiped out from the island. Here's another myth, uh, the empire exported civilization. And here is Niall Ferguson expounding that myth. Um, no organization has done more to impose Western norms of law, order and governance around the world, um, Niall Ferguson. Whilst Britain does have a complex legacy, I think there are some really uh, glaring holes in this argument that need to be challenged. And one of them is the assumption that there wasn't civilization there before. In many cases, that's demonstrably not the case. Um, Mali, for example, um, Mali in Western, uh, Northwestern Sahara in Africa uh, was a place of high learning. In the 16th century, it had a literacy rate of 80%, far higher than any other country uh, in Europe at the time. And these are the Timbuktu manuscripts um, that demonstrate a country of trade, affluence, high learning, um, maths, physics, um, literature in abundance. So civilization was there before. In many places, Britain was not just marching into virgin territory. And this is the Golden Temple in India, built originally in 1509, uh, and then plated in gold and marble in 1809. It does not look like the work of an unsophisticated, uncivilized country. Another point worth making is that the values that Britain exported weren't especially uh, civilized. Of the 71 countries around the world in which same-sex sexual relations are illegal, more than half are former British colonies or protectorates. That's from the International LGBTI Association. In many cases, uh, less prescriptive uh, local customs were ignored. India, for example, had quite a fluid approach to gender and sexuality. But when the British arrived, they ignored that and instituted a punitive penal code. In the 1860s, uh, the Victorian uh, Britons in India outlawed uh, homosexuality, and it was only legalized again in 2018. 
And homosexuality remains illegal in 40 former British colonies, including uh, Uganda, Malaysia and Ghana. So that's that argument that the values exported by Britain weren't always civilized and indeed civilization was often there already. Here's another argument expounded by uh, Niall Ferguson here, who looks like he might be in student digs or trying to flog some 90s office furniture. Furniture, a nice look there, Niall. Um, I mean, I'm not one to talk at the moment. I currently look a bit like uh, a cross between um, Jack Whitehall and an older version of Jack Whitehall, perhaps in a kind of disco shirt from the 80s. So um, I'm not just, you know, I understand that I myself may also be giving off a kooky vibe. Not just you, Niall, in your dodgy office. Let's crack on with the arguments. Uh, the empire enriched colonies. No organization in history has done more to promote the movement of goods, capital and labor than the British Empire, Niall Ferguson. Interesting argument this. Uh, when the British Empire began in the 16th and 17th century, Britain had a parliament, but not much democracy. You could loosely still describe it as a feudal system. Over the next uh, 300 years, Britain was able to transform itself into an industrialized democratic country. If Britain could transform itself in that time, why couldn't other countries? Why assume that it was colonization that catalyzed it? Well, one of the answers that people often give uh, is that those countries lacked the intellectual or social resources to change and develop. Um, I think that argument's quite dubious, and in quite a few cases, it's demonstrably not the case. Uh, India, for example, at the beginning of the 18th century, India's share of the world economy was 23%, as large as all of Europe put together. By the time Britain had left, it was 4%. And that's from the historian Shashi Tharoor uh, in their book, Inglorious Empire, What the British Did to India. In many cases, the empire impoverished the colonies and enriched Britain. India was governed for the benefit of Britain. Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. That's Shashi Tharoor again. And indeed, contemporary politicians and colonialists were quite explicit about this. India is to be bled, said the Marquis of Salisbury, uh, Secretary of State for India in 1870. We conquered India by the sword and by the sword we shall hold it. I am not such a hypocrite to say that we hold India for the Indians. That's William Johnson Hicks. Uh, the Home Secretary in Stanley Baldwin's government speaking in 1928. Oh, just going to the next slide in a minute. So it was not just India whose resources were drained and used for the development of Britain. The historian Robin Blackburn has done a study of the effects and generation of wealth um, caused by the slave trade. So the slave trade where port cities, Liverpool and Bristol, for example, raided the west coast of Africa and abducted slaves to work on Caribbean plantations. Um, that triangle caused uh, a huge stimulus into the British economy. Uh, Robin Blackburn puts the figure at about $700 million a year at the beginning of the 19th century. And he contests that that had a significant effect. It caused investment in farming, in industrial tools, in roads, canals, um, so much so that without that stimulus, Britain may not have been able to industrialize in the way that she did. So we can end up coming to the conclusion that rather than Britain developing the colonies, in the case of the Caribbean and India, the colonies developed Britain. And we might end up agreeing with George Orwell in his portrayal and allegory for empire as uh, imperialism consisting of the policeman and soldier holding the native down whilst the businessman goes through their pockets. Whilst we must hold this view of empire as being quite frequently and pervasively exploitative, it would be a mistake to think that empire was passively received. The argument that empire was passively received tends to go hand in hand with a view of it as being good natured and altruistic. That's expounded by historians such as Lawrence James there, 
There he is looking a little bit like an aged uh, Nick Clegg in his book, The Rise and Fall of the British Empire. This is quite an outdated view and recent historical research contests it and it's our role as historians and educators to catch up with that academic research. Richard Gott, for example, makes this point. Empire was resisted and the colonized were able to shape their own history. Focusing on resistance has been a way of challenging not just a traditional self-indulgent view of empire, but also the customary depiction of the colonized as victims lacking in agency or political will. There are new, numerous examples of resistance, engagement, and uh, sometimes collaboration with empire. But one example that's quite interesting is slavery. I think we have a popular view of slavery as being something that was ended through the benevolent will um, of the British. However, as the broadcaster and writer Kenyon Malik contests, it was not the British Empire that began the struggle against enslavement, but slaves themselves and radicals in Europe. We should also point out that it was not the British who first outlawed slavery. It was in fact the Danes. So shout out to any Danes out there. Here are two um, historical figures who were significant in uh, persuading the British to outlaw slavery and showing that there could be awkward and organized resistance to the slave trade. The first, you probably know him, uh, Toussaint Laverture, the Haitian general and leader, charismatic man who led the Haitian uh, rebellion that became the Haitian revolution in the 1790s. Um, slaves organized themselves in the Caribbean island of Haiti and managed to throw off their shackles of French rule, uh, declaring Haiti a republic and writing a constitution. Uh, the British response was to send 20,000 troops to try and crush it and take it for the British, but they too were humiliatingly defeated by the freed slaves. Um, Taki, who you see uh, on the other side, Taki was a, a shanty um, general um, high up um, with the Ashanti on the west coast of Africa, what is now Ghana. He was abducted as a slave and taken to uh, Jamaica. He too organized um, powerful resistance in the 1780s and kept the British settlers at bay and the other organized uh, armies fighting on behalf of the British uh, for several years. And that scared the bejesus out of the empire and made them realize that slavery was gonna be contested, resisted and awkward to maintain. In short, the subject peoples of empire did not go gently into history's good night. Underneath the veneer of the official record is another story, year in, year out, there was resistance to conquest and rebellion against occupation, Richard got. Empire was not passively received and the British did not march into virgin territory. Instead, the colonizers shaped their own history and told their own stories about the British empire. And it's time for us to rewrite them into the narrative and into our perception um, of Britain's imperial past. So whilst we do that, whilst we think about those complex relationships and write the colonizers back into the story um, by looking at that, that new evidence, it's really important for us as well um, to remind ourselves of that powerful mantra, black history is British history. And a lot of you will be um, familiar with that from Black History Month. And this is a way of us once more um, widening our view of our past and contesting the, the influence of black people and people of color on Britain is nothing new. In fact, it is ubiquitous and powerful um, throughout our long story. One of the great texts for this is uh, Peter Fryer's Staying Power, The History of Black People in Britain. Uh, that was written in 1984 when there was a similar coarsening of debate around identity politics. But it starts with a fantastic line, um, which is there were Africans in Britain before the English came here. And what Peter Fryer is talking about is the Roman Moorish soldiers who were stationed along Hadrian's Wall in the third and fourth century. Uh, Africans before the English came here, the English referring to the Angles and the Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons who came in the fifth and sixth century 
from um, continental Europe, from what is now Germany and France. Furthermore, the first humans to walk on the British Isles were not white. Uh, that's been revealed by recent archaeological and anthropological evidence. It's also important for us to remember that one of the facts of empire is migration and the movement of people, the movement of British settlers and military out to the colonies that often displace people, um, the movement of people within uh, the British Empire and also from uh, colonies back to the metropole, back to Britain. Um, migration is a fact of life uh, and a fact of empire. And this is a, a picture of the Windrush, the boat that came to Britain from the Caribbean in 1948, when Britain encouraged um, immigrants to come here to rebuild the country after the Second World War. And that's a central part of Britain's post-war story, that migrants from around the colonies, from Asia, from the Caribbean, came here to build the welfare state, build the NHS, um, and make Britain stand uh, on its two feet again after the devastation and impact of, uh, of war. And this is the famous uh, uh, and wonderful Anglo-Caribbean academic uh, Stuart Hall, we're here because you were there, referring to that cross-pollination and movement that empire inevitably causes. So what are our take homes? What has empire done to us? We're only beginning to see the British Empire for what it really was. And over the last 10 years, millions of files of new records have come to light, particularly around the area of decolonization. At the same time, we're in a moment when Black Lives Matter is asking questions of us and asking us, how should we remember the past? In Germany, lawmakers on the way to the Reichstag have to pass the overwhelming monument to the Holocaust. Germany builds monuments to its own shame as a warning to politicians and policymakers. Britain's physical and mental spaces do not honestly reflect our history. Terms like white privilege are in danger of becoming meaningless buzzwords. It's really important we try and explain and unpack these words because they can be quite intimidating. But if we place them in a historical context and in the context of Britain, we give them depth and meaning. And that's our role as educators to put intellectual flesh onto the bones. And if we're able to sit in uncomfortable truths, we can see that whiteness has been constructed as economic, cultural, and political advantage via a long, violent process we call empire. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I hope you found it stimulating. And I look forward to continuing uh, this chat with all of you. Please send in, uh, any books that you think are of particular interest and we'll continue to do the same and keep that discussion um, going. I'm now going to pass back to Katie who's going to talk about how to bring this uh, into our classrooms and our communities. Thanks guys. Thank you so much Robin for, for challenging us this evening and giving us so much to take away and reflect upon. I'll just invite us all to consider now the following question. What do we do now? For me, what Robin is inviting us to do here is to decolonize our minds really, to challenge the narrow historical narratives we are presented with. Teachers, we must move towards decolonizing our teaching. But what do we mean by that? Decolonizing the curriculum doesn't mean censorship, erasing history or avoiding particular subjects. I've seen the, the movement being misrepresented in the media in that way. Instead, it's about asking the following critical questions of our teaching 
To what extent does the content of this lesson, topic or curriculum reinforce biased dominant narratives or myths? And how can we safeguard against this? How can we include a diversity of texts, voices and perspectives in what we're teaching? How can we engineer more opportunities for critical discussion? When we are planning a particular topic, to what extent are we assuming a particular worldview? And, and what are the characteristics of this assumed profile of student? And who are we othering in this? We will send out a crib sheet that will help to deconstruct some of these key questions. And we'll also send out a reading list for tonight's session. So we would just like to say thank you so much for joining us this evening. On behalf of me, Robin and Hallam TSA, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again.